Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm really excited about tonight's event, um, which just sort of happened almost by accident. Um, uh, I had written to MediaBurn about some old uh, high 8 videotapes I had from the time I lived in Chicago when I videotaped a bunch of experimental performances and all sorts of events in Chicago and was looking to have them digitized or somehow made accessible to people because I didn't have the means to do that. And through that, um, I was introduced to Adam because he was going to take the tapes to Chicago from here. And, um, and we got to talking and I realized he was writing this book and it was coming out soon and I was so excited about it and invited him to come and talk to us once it was completed. Um, so I'm just really, really excited about how things happen by accident. And then you meet someone who's wonderful and who you're so glad that you met because they're doing the work that's so important of archiving our culture and preserving it for future generations and making it accessible. And also writing a book and making accessible to us um, material about him that has been long been sort of hidden. Um, and I can't, I just got my copy today. You should get yours too. And uh, I can't wait to read it. But more, less about this and now about Adam. Adam Charles Hart is a scholar and archivist and the curator for Media Burn, which is an independent video archive based in Chicago. He is the author of Monstrous Forms, Moving Image Horror Across Media, as well as Raising the Dead, the work of George A. Romero, which was published this month by Oxford University Press. And um, I think I shouldn't take up any more of your time and just welcome Adam and uh, turn it over to you. Okay. Welcome. So th thanks so much, Susie and Harrison and Nika. This is really, this is really exciting. Um, we're actually gonna start off with a movie. Um, are you uh, ready to go, Stephen? Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephen. That was really delightful. <sighs> Just to set the tone. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so. Instead of doing a straight reading from the book tonight, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit basically about how weird it was that um, George Romero and his pals made a movie uh, in 1968. And more than that, how improbable it was that a movie made in Pittsburgh, of all places, would be watched by millions of people over the course of the last 55 years and be treasured enough that we would be talking about it today. Um, that movie was, of course, Night of the Living Dead. It's one of the most watched, most influential, most beloved movies ever made. I say without hyperbole. It's been imitated, ripped off, and let's say the inspiration for thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of zombie movies, TV shows, and video games, and books, and comics, and on and on and on. Its legacy will keep going much longer than any of us are here, who are here today, are on this planet, I am sure. Um, although by that time, we might all be undead and just wandering the post-apocalyptic landscape, so, you know, the, the prophecy will have come true. Um, but that said, it's also a weird little curio made by a bunch of people who had never had any substantial involvement with a quote-unquote real movie. In Pittsburgh, the only movies they would get to work on were the movies they made, and they had to figure out how to make them, which they did. It's not right to say that Night of the Living Dead was made by amateurs or by inexperienced filmmakers. Romero and his collaborators had been making movies and TV for nearly a decade by the time they started filming Night. But it is absolutely accurate to say that it was made by outsiders. In the 1960s, Pittsburgh could not have been farther from not just Hollywood, and I'm speaking not just geographically, but metaphorically, but also from the kind of art house indie scene that was, blossom that was blossoming in New York or even a little bit in Chicago. So George was born in the Bronx in 1940. He arrived in Pittsburgh in the late 50s as an art major at Carnegie Tech. That's Carnegie Tech. But most of his energy was already going into movies. 
Since he was a little kid, he had been making movies in the backyard on a Super 8 camera he'd gotten from his uncle. And by the time he got to college, he was ready to make the leap into making real movies. From an early age, he was concerned not just with the exciting artistic side of filmmaking, coming up with new ideas for stories or new ways to shoot things, special effects, that sort of thing, but with making a career of it. He seems to have inherited that from his dad, a professional printer, which is an artist, but a practical one. Maybe the defining feature of movie making as an art form, or one of them anyways, is that it's outrageously expensive. <laughs> And from a very early age, Romero was thinking about how to make filmmaking a sustainable career. He needs to, he'd need to raise money for equipment and film stocks and sets and actors, but also he'd need to pay rent, and so would everybody else he was working with. So for Romero and his friends, making a career out of filmmaking meant figuring out, one, how to make a real movie, meaning a feature-length film that would play in actual movie theaters, and two, how to get money. So shortly after Romero started school, he met Rudy Ritchie, and the two of them started writing scripts and filming little things with an eye towards making something bigger. Their circle grew, including an extremely tall, lanky actor who just started at the Pittsburgh Playhouse named Russ Streiner, and an English lit major from WVU named Jack Russo. They started making short films for TV, first short promotional documentaries about fun activities for kids, for a TV program produced by the local chapter of a woman's club called the Junior League. There were puppets involved. Um, and they used those short films uh, as, a kind of, uh, as a kind of work reel to get first the Allegheny Observatory and before long, a bunch of other places to pay them to make commercials. Uh, soon they were making ads for local apartment stores and restaurants in Kennywood and the Pennsylvania Tourism Board and on and on and on. They were learning on the job, slowly accumulating equipment and experience, and they were excelling. This was essentially their film school, and it was being sponsored by Duke Beer. Um, so uh, that was paying the bills but they were working hard to try to get an actual movie made. And they were incredibly ambitious, the kind of ambition that comes from being in your early 20s and not yet encountering an entire sector of the economy that seemed designed primarily to tell you no and grind you down bit by bit, um, which is the impression you get from uh, reading interviews with Romero later in his life. <laughs> uh, so they were going to make great art and they were going to build not just their own production studio, but an entire film industry. And they were going to do it in Pittsburgh. To do so, they'd have to build it from the ground up. And to reiterate, they had to figure out each step of that progression for themselves. So briefly, I'd like to jump forward in time to Night of the Living Dead's release. I guess the Duke Beer commercial is still playing. <laughs> Uh, so briefly, I'd like to jump forward in time to Night of the Living Dead's release. It did extremely well in Pittsburgh, where it premiered at the Fulton Theater downtown, which is now the Byam, in October 1968, and played in 10 or 12 other theaters in the city uh, to what the industry refers to as Bafo box office. It soon opened elsewhere and did well, though it wasn't quite the blockbuster that it was in its hometown. Um, Knight's eventual financial success kind of came about because it just stuck around. It was re-released a year later on a double bill with a little remembered movie called Slaves starring Ossie Davis and Dionne Warwick. And it was during that re-release that the hipsters, the intellectuals, the horror nerds, and Andy Warhol's pals all found it. The juxtaposition with a drama about America's racist history may have made Knight's own bold racial commentary more evident. The fact that Slaves was directed by one of Hollywood's most famously outspoken political filmmakers, the blacklisted Herbert Bieberman of Salt of the Earth fame, may have attracted the attention of more politically conscious audiences. Or it might simply be the case that Night of the Living Dead just needed a little bit of time for the right people to finally realize what they were watching. Whatever the reasons, about a year after its initial release, Knight was written up in a rave in the Village Voice, and after that, got the attention of critics 
writing for influential international magazines like Sight and Sound. And by 1971, it was playing at the Museum of Modern Art in New York as part of a series that included the following week, a screening from one of the world's most prominent avant-garde filmmakers, Jonas Mikis. And it was also sticking around in less reputable parts of the movie-going world. It was one of the original midnight movies, and it found a second or maybe a third or fourth life playing weekly on Friday and Saturday nights in big cities and university towns. And for reasons that I'll get into a little later, it started showing up all over the place in theaters, at special screenings by clubs, student groups, and no kidding, libraries and churches, uh, and also on TV. Uh, but in late 1968 and early 1969, Night of the Living Dead had not yet become respectable. Not even close. Middlebrow critics for the New York Times and infamously Roger Ebert, more on that in a second, seem to relish the opportunity to utterly dismiss and roll their eyes and maybe even reach for their fainting couches at this ridiculous movie with blood and gore and flesh eating that was made by, and I quote, some people in Pittsburgh. Yes, <laughs> that's right, I quote again, filmmakers from Pittsburgh of all places, or to quote the Los Angeles Free Press, two college students in Baltimore. <laughs> um, the most widely read, most impactful piece of writing about Night of the Living Dead during its first release came from a not yet famous Roger Ebert. Long before his TV show, but also well before his Pulitzer, even slightly before his own foray into low budget genre filmmaking by writing the sleazy sexploitation classic Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Indeed, you have to ask who exactly is casting the first stone regarding good taste, Mr. Ebert. Roger Ebert's review was published in his home paper, the Chicago Sun-Times, and then syndicated for some reason all over the country. Uh, I think this all came after it was reprinted in Reader's Digest of all places. Um, the review got a shocking amount of attention for a write-up of what was really a very little horror movie that almost everybody reading it would have never heard of before. Um, in its own pre-internet way, Ebert's review went viral. Uh, he was so upset, Night of the Living Dead was shocking. This wasn't a fun horror movie, he said. This was real terror that traumatized children and made them cry. It was irresponsible and crass and shocking. Somehow, this review that was read by countless people in their hometown paper, drumming up a panic about this horror movie that, again, the vast majority of readers had never heard of, uh, that was the most terrifying possible experience that anyone could ever have in a movie theater, that only the bravest audience members could withstand the pure shocking terror on screen. Somehow that didn't hurt the ticket sales, uh, even if Ebert, of course, absolutely loathed the movie. So one of my favorite discoveries in George Romero's archive is that George seemed to love this review. Um, he had a bunch of copies, sometimes a bunch of photocopies of each version of it. And again, it was syndicated all over the country. So, you know, you've got some from Tampa, some from Chicago, some from Reader's Digest, and on and on and on. Um, I like to think that he found it funny, but uh, that is pure speculation, of course. Um, and Ebert would actually eventually more or less apologize for the review. <laughs> he wrote kind of a retraction years later on his website, but also he became one of Romero's like most vocal champions, starting with Dawn of the Dead. Um, I feel like he felt like he had something to, uh, uh, to atone for, let's say. Um, anyways, uh, we're now seemingly a long way away from the lofty artistic ambitions of young George and his friends at Carnegie Tech with this low budget exploitation horror movie that was shocking critics all over the place. Uh, once upon a time, they had been inspired by filmmakers like Ingmar Bergman, Stanley Kubrick, and maybe especially Orson Welles. So let's go back to college and sort of retrace our steps. The first real turning point in George Romero's artistic life came when he was 20 in 1960 when he was in a play, or rather he turned 20 during the rehearsals. At the Morris Kaufman Auditorium, now Belfield Hall, a couple of blocks away from here across from the cathedral, Romero in his first acting role outside of high school plays or backyard home movies, starred in what might have been the first production outside of New York, 
of the Living Theater's The Connection, an avant-garde play that melded jazz performance and fourth wall breaking structure with a risque story about junkies and jazz musicians waiting around for a fix. The play was a scandal and a sensation in New York in 1959, both for its boundary pushing and for what its detractors saw as a total lack of substance. The whole thing takes place inside a single apartment and there's no real story. Everybody waits around, getting increasingly agitated and frustrated. Some people show up, there are lots of conversations, and eventually the dealer arrives. At the end of the play, Romero's character, Leach, the owner of the CD loft apartment in which it all takes place, overdoses. Leach's overdose required Romero to shoot up on stage, an effect they achieved with a simple syringe and a pack, patch of silly putty. The audience, Romero would later recall, responded viscerally to the sight. They were shocked, which Romero found positively thrilling. They gasped. I had the power to make them gasp. I was hooked. I had to find a way to make the audience gasp again. He had a flair for the theatrical. Um, Romero would claim he was cast in that play because he was, quote, large, which he jokingly called his only impressive quality. But that play, that play would shape his life and career in a million different ways. The connection in 2024, regarded by many as one of the great works of American theater, would provide a template for Romero as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. The broad, uh, the broad plot outline, in which a small group of people are stuck in a small enclosed space together and grow frustrated, agitated, bored, start fighting with each other, etc. That describes Night of the Living Dead. It also describes a good half of his feature filmography and more than a few scripts that went unfilmed in his archive. More than that, it was the kind of story that Romero was really interested in telling. Or rather, Romero was less interested in telling stories in narrative terms uh, than he was in exploring characters, in putting people in conflict and conversation and then seeing what happened. Uh, in his archive, you can see visible evidence of what re excited Romero the most. His first drafts are always lopsided, uh, with one or two scenes of characters talking getting blown way out of proportion to the overall narrative structure, taking up a far greater share of the page count than they would in an actual film. He never worked from an outline and tended to think about things like pacing and story in his second draft and would just follow his muse into conversations and conflicts and, you know, vibes <laughs> the first time around. Um, and also more than that, uh, as much as that, without getting too far off track into the connection and other projects, it raised all sorts of big important questions about art and life and even filmmaking itself that would clearly echo in Romero's head throughout his life. Plus, again, he realized it was really fun to shock people. Um, more immediately, however, and more concretely, the, that play altered his trajectory as a student. Uh, and the audience for one of those performances was Ted Hoffman, the dean of Carnegie Tech's School of Fine Arts and a theater guy. Um, again, R Romero was like, probably in this room at some point. I don't know what it was in 1959, but he probably took a class in here. <laughs> you know, set in the scene. Um, so Romero claimed that he wasn't all that talented as a visual artist, that was his first major, uh, or at least that's what his teachers seemed to tell him. So when Hoffman suggested that George switch majors to drama, he was pretty easily persuaded. Uh, that switch to theater, the theater department led to some minor roles in school plays alongside other notably, car notable Carnegie Tech <laughs> alums. Uh, most delightfully, future character actor Rene Aubergenois. Uh, it also led to Romero kind of drifting away from school before graduating. Uh, I don't know if he ever officially dropped out, uh, but changing majors meant that he had to take a whole bunch of new classes. Uh, he was already fairly close to graduating as an art major um, by the time he made that switch. Um, and in an era in which college didn't mean a lifetime of debt and every career didn't exactly require a college degree, he just kind of left. Um, or rather, he was busy with other stuff. The switch to theater focused him on wanting to tell his own stories. 
he and Russ Striner, along with Rudy and Rudy's cousin Richard Ritchie, uh, and a handful of others were already making their first feature film. Um, six or so years before Night of the Living Dead came out, Romero directed and completed filming on his first movie uh, called Expostulations. It was filmed and at least in part edited, but still was not quite completed. Uh, it was an anthology film with five different segments, each one with a different tone and genre. Um, let's see. Um, a good chunk, the camera and a good chunk of the budget came from the, same, came from the same uncle who had given Romero his first camera. His name was Monroe Udell, a widely respected doctor in New York that Romero often referred to as his rich uncle Monty. Um, and he was a big benefactor throughout the first decade or so of Romero's career. Uh, but even with Uncle Monty's support and the money that they had started to raise on their own making commercials, there were basic technological limitations. They shot on 16 millimeter, which was essentially a silent format, which is to say that if you wanted to actually hear dialogue or sound effects or music, you had to add that in post-production separately which is a complicated and frequently expensive process that required specialized expertise. And they'd raise the money for a soundtrack, but the firm that they'd hired went out of business in the process of making it. So the film was shot, but they couldn't really screen it, couldn't find anybody else to finish the soundtrack. And I've never found an explanation for this, but they just kind of let it lie. They stopped working on it, um, I think in part because they were already on to the next thing. Um, I also want to point out uh, the sort of uh, naivete of them as young filmmakers. So I mentioned that it was fully si shot fully silent, <laughs> five short films put back to back. It was also two and a half hours long. So I don't know, even though Romero had this like practical bone in his body that um, he really had a commercial instinct, I guess you could say. Um, okay, so in 1964, they were on to the next thing. Romero and Rudy Ritchie wrote a screenplay called Wine of the Fawn, which is, if you ask me, an absolutely terrible title, um, one that sounds almost like the parody version of itself. Uh, Romero was always terrible at coming up with titles <laughs> for someone who I think is such an inspired and frequently brilliant writer and artist. He just, he had this one really glaring blind spot that he couldn't come up with a title, <laughs> not to save his life. Um, and before you say, he did not come up with Night of the Living Dead. The original title for Night of the Living Dead was Night of the Anubis which is a similarly terrible title. After some workshopping, they came up with Night of the Flesh Eaters, which is better, um, but the distributor had released a film called The Flesh Eaters a couple of years earlier. The distributor's really interesting, by the way. They released two kinds of movies, the lowest, lowest of lowbrow exploitation horror movies, and then the artiest of arty highbrow movies. Um, which made it an interesting place for Night of the Living Dead to be. Um, but yeah, they had a movie called Flesh Eaters a couple of years earlier, so they were like, well, that's out. Let's call it Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and that's also why it's in the public domain, because <laughs> the distributor forgot to include a copyright notice. Um, okay, so this film, Wine of the Fawn, which was not shot, but which was written, and which they spent several, a couple of years trying to develop, uh, was clearly inspired by the deeply philosophical, arty films of Swedish filmmaker Ingmar Bergman, The Seventh Seal in particular, but also by the Shakespeare films of Orson Welles. It was set in medieval England. The setting was a budgetary choice, as they figured that southwestern Pennsylvania could be a cheap and easy double for the English countryside. They would only, they would only need sets for a handful of interior scenes. Uh, they drew their cast, from friends at the Pittsburgh Playhouse and a couple of people from the production of The Connection, along with a local celebrity, KDKA's radio, K KDKA Radio's Reg Kordic. This is a couple of pages from the script, um, which, as you'll notice, doesn't look like your standard script. Um, this is, to me, a really powerful and actually kind of touching uh, 
bit of evidence of just how far from Hollywood Pittsburgh really was. The script was written basically in prose like a novel with breaks for dialogue. There are no camera directions, no specifications about close-ups or tracking shots. There's very little indication of how a scene would be put together in the way that a Hollywood trained crew would need. Where do we put the camera and for how long? Where do the lights go? How many angles do we need of this particular line of dialogue? Of course, they had never been on a professional Hollywood film set. They had never been to film school. This was just the way they had figured out together how to work. And in that sense, it did work. Um, it was just fine for their purposes. Romero or Russ Streiner would be the ones holding the camera. Their buddy, Bill Heinzman, would be in charge of lighting. And everybody on set would be, basically, a close friend and frequent collaborator. They were used to working with each other, and I'm sure that they'd, plot, they'd shot plenty of commercials with far less schematic planning than this. But also, whenever possible, the way Romero liked to work was to figure out the shot on set. Inspiration came from seeing the actors on the scene, not from, what, not from imagining what it might need to look like while sitting at your typewriter before the roles had even been cast. In a story dripping with metaphorical significance, Wine of the Fawn uh, followed an innocent young boy leaving home for the first time after the death of his father and encounter encountering all sorts of temptation, violence, and disillusionment. The script ends with a hero trying to save his friend from being stoned to death in a public execution uh, for being a blasphemous witch. And the hero gets hit in the head with a rock and then stabbed to death by a sweet-looking, innocent young child caught up in the frenzy of the mob. It was an utterly savage, devastating ending, far and away the most vivid and powerful section of a very compelling but uneven script. Bits and pieces of that final scene would reappear in different forms in Romero's writings, starting, of course, with Night of the Living Dead, which he started writing with Jack Russo only a year or two later. The ending also stands out from the rest of the script. Uh, it's far more vivid and searing than anything comes before it that comes before it, which is a lesson that Romero quickly learned. His next script for Night of the Living Dead would start with its most intense, vivid scene, and then the structure of the film is them working their way back up to that intensity. Um, so even though Wine of the Fawn was conceived to be as low budget as possible, making a movie to be released in theaters was still incredibly expensive. They were using their day job as admin to purchase equipment, but they needed more, and just the basic cost of film stock needed to shoot on was considerable. And there's nothing about Wine of the Fawn that would strike funders as making it a particularly good bet, financially speaking. When they eventually hit on the idea for Night a couple years later, uh, they were at a new place in their careers. They had gone about as far as they could go making commercials in Pittsburgh. They were successful to a point, but not enough to fully break into Madison Avenue that would likely require relocating to New York as Pittsburgh was basically considered to be the boonies for the high rollers in Manhattan, and they tended to look down on anything that came out of this city with about as much condescension as a New York Times film critic. Um, but also, that's not what they wanted to do. Romero and his collaborators had no interest in becoming full-time ad makers. They were doing that to support their real passion. They wanted to make movies. So how could they do that? How could they actually make a movie that would play in actual theaters? Well, there is one genre that had a track record of getting funding, distribution, and even finding pretty decent audiences for independent productions, horror. As with Wine of the Fawn, they wrote Night of the Living Dead with an eye towards budget. They'd shoot outside of Evan City with an all-local cast, including two of Reg Cordick's collaborators, Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman. Um, they'd be the crew, of course. They formed a new con a production company with each member contributing funds and raising money. They found a farmhouse slated for demolition that they could use for almost nothing, and they kept working during the production. 
frequently taking breaks to make another ad and pay the bills. Speaking of which, they originally planned to shoot for just a couple of weeks, but that stretched into the better part of a year. Uh, Every story about this is different. <laughs> like I have not found any agreement uh, in any interview uh, about how long the shoot actually took. But suffice it to say that most of 1967 was spent filming Night of the Living Dead for these guys. Uh, this is partially the privilege of youth. They were still mostly in their 20s. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of resources, but they had a whole lot of energy and seemingly a whole lot of time. Rather, they had time to shoot in quick spurts in between the commercials that were allowing them to shoot the next bit. Um, so that lengthened the production, these frequent breaks, but so did their focus on artistry. What made Night of the Living Dead unique among horror movies, especially low-budget horror movies, uh, was all the ways in which it was the culmination of a full decade of writing and filmmaking for George Romero and his collaborators. You can see all of Romero's influences and previous endeavors shaping a very strange, very unexpected horror movie in Night. All sorts of lofty, thematic, and philosophical concerns that Romero had explored in the artier Wine of the Fawn make a re reappearance here, but in less pretentious clothing. Indeed, whatever intellectual sophistication there was, was wholly lost on most of the first rounds of critics and audiences. The visual style that Romero had been developing over countless hours of making commercials melded the speed and efficiency of quick, low-budget filmmaking with the striking, vivid images seen in the movies of Orson Welles and Ingmar Bergman. That complex, dynamic style was here put in service of a story that was not exactly Macbeth or Wild Strawberries. And again, critics failed to notice how much work Romero and co. had put into creating a distinct but unobtrusive visual scheme um, filled with expressionistic angles, deep shadows, and complex staging, even though Night of the Living Dead took place in the world's most boring looking Midwestern farmhouse. That was of course the big reason why the production took so long. They weren't just setting up the camera and letting the scene play out in front of it, which was the MO for a whole lot of low budget horror movies at the time. They were finding the most exciting, most Wellsian, most Bergmanesque ways to film and light each shot. Where to put the actors so that the shot seems striking and exciting even if it was two people standing in front of a wholly blank wall. Eventually, critics and audiences came around to noticing the nuances of this movie about corpses coming back to life. Critics would soon understand it as capturing the feeling of late 60s America far more vividly and powerfully than countless other movies that were more direct and more realistic about their critiques. Critics would also realize eventually how much better it looked than most of the movies with 10, 20, or 30 times its budget that were coming out of Hollywood. It makes a strange kind of sense that the first people to really embrace the movie were aligned with the avant-garde and the downtown New York art scene. The artists and writers that first championed Night of the Living Dead recognized and appreciated its provocations the ways that it pointedly violated notions of good taste, no pun intended, apologies, but also the ways that it was provocative but nuanced. It shocked you with gore and horror, sure, but it also shocked you by pulling the rug out from underneath you at every opportunity. Seemingly every cliche of a Hollywood script was overturned. The blonde heroine, or who you, assume, who you assume to be the blonde heroine, turns out to be a traumatized non-entity for the majority of the movie. The attractive young couple that are so sweet with each other gets blown up and barbecued. The villain is less the flesh-eating zombies uh, massing outside than the aggressive and kind of pitiful patriarch who, in another script, would be heroically fighting to save his daughter's life. That daughter, and I'm just curious if anybody in here had Miss Schoen as an art teacher 
when I taught this in uh, at Pitt a couple years ago, there were a couple of students who had had the actress who played the daughter in Night of the Living Dead as a teacher in elementary school. Um, that daughter, uh, by the way, killed and ate her parents. Uh, and if that's not enough, the impossibly charismatic hero doesn't even make it to the end of the movie. And that hero who punches the white patriarch and later shoots him, who gets killed unceremoniously by an all-white posse with German shepherds and a whole lot of rifles, is black. The movie almost feels like it's going through a checklist of audience expectations that it can overturn. So people came around to Night of the Living Dead eventually, and it serves as the founding document in the Pittsburgh film industry. But it was a mixed blessing for the filmmakers. The distributor withheld the filmmaker's share of the profit, then declared bankruptcy when they sued. Romero would later muse ruefully that they literally ended up with three typewriters from the distributor's office. And the movie, thanks to neglect on the part of the distributor, was in the public domain. That wasn't a huge factor in the money for the initial release, but eventually that meant that prints were circulating freely and being shown by anybody who could get their hands on it. That meant movies, that, uh, that meant movie theaters, that meant TV, that meant clubs and libraries and, again, churches, which is really fun to read in old newspapers because they almost always raise some controversy. Um, that also meant that Night of the Living Dead could spread freely throughout the country and the world that it could become influential and beloved on a level that was genuinely unprecedented for a horror movie on its budget and one from Pittsburgh, of all places. A mixed blessing, to say the least. Romero, for his part, had an extremely successful career, but he was always tethered to horror movies and to zombies more specifically. This was a success that wrote Romero's ticket for the film industry but which specified the terms in which he could operate within it. He'd have to find ways to adapt his diverse and varied artistic ambitions to a genre that at times seemed like a straitjacket. But Night of the Living Dead was a really good lesson. He and his collaborators had rewritten all the rules of horror once, and doing so let them work through all the intellectual, visual, artistic ambitions that were driving them. Romero would just have to do that again and again. It's what made him such a great artist. He was never particularly concerned with the shape or the expectations of the horror genre. He was only interested, he was only interested in it because he knew he needed to reinvent it completely every time out. Sure, he was making a zombie movie or a vampire movie or a movie about a killer helper monkey but within those very broad boundaries, he realized he could do pretty much anything. Thank you very much. I, we have time for a little, a few questions if anybody is interested. Um, and I should say, uh, if you wanna see any of George Romero's movies, we got some opportunities coming up in Pittsburgh. Uh, next week, I'm introducing a screening of Night of the Living Dead at Row House. And the following week, uh, Dawn of the Dead is actually coming back to theaters at the Harris. Um, and I'll be there to introduce at least one of those screenings and talk about the original version of Dawn of the Dead or the original draft of Dawn of the Dead that almost starred O.J. Simpson and had zombies uh, toting, uh, toting rifles and operating a complex network of human meat distribution out of the Monroeville Mall. Um, and also there's a one-eyed telepath who seemed to control the zombies' brains. Um, so if you're interested in hearing more about that, I'll be there for one of those. Um, Um, there are some similarities to the way that uh, Night of the Living Dead looks with um, the only film that was made by 
Oh, gosh, my brain just went blank. But it's called Night of the Hunter. Yeah, Charles Lawton's. Yeah, Charles absolutely. Lawton's film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the expressionism. Like, yeah. I feel like that's even more common than in Wells. Yeah. Uh, Wells is just the one that, that Romero would always cite. Yeah. Like, when talking about the style, he would, you know, kind of self-deprecatingly say that um, he was trying to rip off Orson Welles as best that he could on his budget. Yeah, but I feel like the feeling of it, Night absolutely. of the Living Dead is much closer to Night of the Hunter, the, the underbelly of American culture. Yeah, it, it feels like they would make a really great uh, double feature, right? Yeah. So I know you had access to the archive and you uncovered all this amazing stuff and then me and you worked on that Romero Festival together and we got to see a lot of this early work. Yeah. My question is, what brought you to decide, you know what, I'm going to make a book out of this. The world should, should know this. Um, so uh, I may, may not have introduced this properly, but so I was at the Pitt Library with Ben Rubin, who's here, um, and we had the job uh, and the privilege of processing and cataloging George Romero's archives uh, a couple of years ago. It was so great. <laughs> it really ruled because there were all of these boxes filled with God knows what, like they weren't really labeled or organized or anything. And we start going through them and see, well, here's a script that we've never hear heard of. And there's another script that we've never heard of. And here's another one. And pretty soon we start tallying it up and we have hundreds of drafts, literally hundreds of drafts of scripts and treatments and unfinished fragments of stuff that never got filmed. Um, Romero was an incredibly prolific writer. He never stopped creating. He never had writer's block. He had producer's block. <laughs> if he could just film everything, he would have made 50 movies or something like that. Um, and he worked in just a really diverse range of styles and genres. He had so many interests. And the, the, initial, the initial impulse for the book was just, this stuff is so cool, I have to share this with everybody um, and just so, sort of communicate the excitement. Um, but then as I started to write it, I realized that seeing all this completely hidden side of his artistic output was making me rethink these movies that like, I thought there was nothing left to say about Night of the Living Dead. I initially was not gonna discuss Night of the Living Dead in the book because it's been discussed to death. There's nothing new to say about it. Um, but then I started reading like the other stuff that he was working on and realized like, oh, this actually like reveals some really interesting things about what he was thinking and what he was trying to not just say, but like trying to make Night of the Living Dead be and realizing that like it was this culmination of a decade of trying to make an art film, and that it's basically an art film just with, you know, zombies coming out of the grave and trying to eat your flesh, <laughs> um, which is its own kind of really interesting, uh, really interesting, you know, puzzle to unravel. Um, but uh, once, I, once I started writing about that, I just kind of realized like, oh, this does, you know, reveal all sorts of new stuff about the really familiar, the really familiar movies. And so, I don't know, by that point, I just felt like I had to finish the book <laughs> and sort of get this all out there because I was so excited about it. Hi. Hey, Steve. <laughs> uh, curious, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Who do you think, who, who would you compare the modern day guys to Romero? I think Any, the, anyone who's been inspired by him or? Well, there's been a million people genre. inspired by him, but it's kind of hard to draw a connection because it just was so strange that he made a career out of being a filmmaker in Pittsburgh. And I know we have at least one person who got a career making movies in Pittsburgh, in part because George built that. Um, and uh, so 
in part because of movies like Night of the Living Dead, it's no longer weird to have an independent movie, whether it's genre or, you know, some arty, talky drama or whatever, coming out of a place like Pittsburgh. Um, it's no longer weird for just anybody to feel like they could make a movie. Um, so there are plenty of people who have taken like stylistic or thematic inspiration from George Romero. Like, I don't know, Jordan Peele talks about George Romero all the time, and it's really easy to see a direct connection between the kind of social commentary that George Romero makes in his, you know, his monster movies with Jordan Peele's horror. Um, but at the same time, like what, what he's doing is different because the path has been blazed a little bit. I rewatched Night of the Living Dead uh, in a movie theater last week. And first of all, holds up, good movie. <laughs> but it, it's also, it's a really strange movie. Um, every choice is weird. It's really evident that nobody there has really been in front of a camera before. Um, and, you know, I say that with like love and affection. <laughs> um, because nobody there really had. Nobody involved in the production had been involved in a professional feature film before, except for George, who had like an internship on the, for the like exterior, where he was there for the exterior New York scenes of North by Northwest in like, like summer one year in college. And like the experience was so like dull and disillusioning that he almost like stopped trying to make movies because it was just a lot of bored technicians standing around. Alfred Hitchcock wasn't anywhere near there. Cary Grant wasn't around. It was just, you know, basic like, well, we need to get this exterior shot of this building. It's gonna take all day to do that. And so that's, that is the limit of their <laughs> experience outside of their own film sets, basically. And you can see that, like they're, the choices in that movie are not choices that anybody else would make. If you gave that movie to a Hollywood editor, they would cut it down to like 35 minutes. <laughs> um, it's a lot of just sitting around waiting for stuff to happen. But that's its charm because it couldn't have been made by anybody else. You know, all the choices were very specific to this you know, group of pals who had been making movies for about a decade, yeah. That was a really long answer to a simple question. <laughs> um, Marty, you, you knew Rudy Ritchie a little bit, right? That, that was him in yeah. Time Present. Okay, yeah. So the, the guy in the short film was basically like the first person that George Romero met in Pittsburgh. They were really close friends. Um, I don't know, did Rudy go to Carnegie Tech or was he a pick guy? Play with him. Yeah, he was in The Connection and they started making movies together almost immediately. Um, and reports, interviews, uh, reports differ on what the nature of those movies were. <laughs> I found an interview with George Romero where the interview had clearly done his homework and was like, well, I read this interview with Rudy Ritchie who said you guys were making this, this, and this. In 1959, Romero was like, what? What are you, what are you talking about? No. <laughs> so it was a long time ago, but they had been trying to like make movies since the second that they both got to, got to college. Yeah. Oh. Sorry if I missed this before. I was curious to know who was reading off the T.S. Eliot um, prose in the film? Why, that was Mr. T.S. Eliot. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any question here? So, well, since we're talking about time present, I, I, I thought I should just add a projectionist clarification. When I made the comment about 65, um, so what I meant by that, I, I realize some, some folks here might not understand what I meant by that. The, the edge code is you know, not on screen, it's just, you know, just at the edge of the, it's, it's when the film stock was manufactured. So I wasn't saying that, um, I, I, I trust that you would know best when that, um, no, wh I, when, when the film was, ma was made. I realize there's a, there's a Pittsburgh uh, Press or Post-Gazette newspaper. I'm going to go back and look at that with a loop a and call, see yeah. if, I can, if I can see the date on it. I, um, but the film stock this prints on, 
was manufactured in 65. Though, of uh, course, the film could have been printed onto the stock a year or, or even two later. St Stephen, I think that you and I are the only ones who really care about this, but yeah. I think we both Probably. really care about this. Yeah. <laughs> I was shazamming all the songs just to like figure out, well, this version of Sounds of Silence, when did that come out? Uh, everything that I should say, it came out in 64, so 65 seems likely. Um, I found something that mentioned six. I, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. There was a Norma Tinning. I did a lot of this research back when the screening was happening. Yeah. I raise my hand. Adam. After the copyright debacle, yeah. not being on any of the films, was he ever able to make any money? Yeah, so kind of. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, sorry that I kind of zipped through it. I was in the, in the interest of, you know, making sure everybody like could follow along instead of just reading from one chapter that like really got into the weeds on something. I tried to pick and choose from a few different things. But yeah, so if you didn't know, Night of the Living Dead is in the public domain, which means that there's 8 million copies of it on YouTube. Um, and that there are certain people who may go after you if you try to screen it, but they kind of don't have a legal case for it. Um, they might <laughs> annoy you into it, but uh, you know, like it's actually still in the public domain by most understandings of the law. The reason for that is that according to the law in 1968, you had to have the C um, with a circle around it on the actual film. When the distributor changed the title from what originally had been Night of the Flesh Eaters, C, circle around it, that the filmmakers had produced, um, that put it into the public domain so that anybody could show it without owing any money to the person who owned the copyright because officially nobody owned the copyright. Um, as I said, and sorry if I kind of zipped through it, that kind of didn't make that much of a difference. Like initially, if all the prints are owned by the distributor, every theater would have had to pay them. The distributor was making money off of this. Um, they just, the bigger sin is kind of that they never gave those profits to George Romero <laughs> and the other producers of the film. Um, where it really came into, uh, where it really came into play was years later, like being on TV, being on the midnight movie circuit, and just being the sort of thing that movie theaters used to have like collections of film prints and they could throw that on any time because it was literally free to show. They didn't have to pay a rental fee. Um, that's again, as I said, that's also why it became this like worldwide phenomenon that like everybody knows what a zombie is because it was shown so much. Um, so to answer your question, the way that they made money off of it was one, by making a sequel, uh, Dawn of the Dead, and that was a shockingly huge hit. Like, George Romero was shocked how that there were like lines around the block. It was a gigantic hit worldwide. Um, and another way that they did it was by remaking it in 1990. Um, by that point, it was kind of inevitable that somebody would do a remake. Um, and so, you know, George Romero and Russ Streiner and John Russo and um, was anybody else involved in it? Well, Tom Savini directed it, but I can't remember if anybody else from the original production was involved. But George wrote a script. They all produced it. Tom Savini, um, another local Pittsburgh boy, who actually met Romero trying out for Wine of the Fawn. That's uh, the first time that they met. I found... Um, some early reviews and uh, photographs from Tom Savini's first uh, uh, performance at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. He was in a uh, funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Um, it's very, very fun local lore. Um, anyways, um, but so they made that and it, like it did fine. You know, it wasn't a huge hit, but they all got a little payday for it and they put that out on video, DVD, eventually, and got something. Um, and I guess there's also like conventions and things like that. Like there are still, you know, all over the place, but in 
it now in Monroeville that they have the Living Dead weekend every year? You know, people come from all over the world to... <laughs> is the zombie walk still happening? I knew it happened for a long time. Is the zombie walk still happening? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so kind of indirectly, but, you know, there, there were a few paydays along the way. Just not, not like directly equal to the number of people who have seen it or like the, the impact that it had worldwide. Like if you wanna talk about how influential it is just in terms of like how many movies have been made copying it in some way or inspired by it, you kinda of gotta to go to stuff like, I don't know, Star Wars or Jaws or something like that. Um, and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg have a whole lot more money than George Romero ever had. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I was wondering about uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, his like horror's role in film accessibility um, and like independent artists and just worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so horror is a crowd pleaser, um, but it's also a genre where like high production values and big name stars are typically not expected or required. So the ease of access is greater than it is for like trying to make even something that seems close like a science fiction movie. You know, like you need some atmosphere and like some skilled filmmaking and a good script and then like you can do really well and that's always been the case. I think that also because horror is a really like surreal and nightmarish genre, it lets skilled filmmakers really play with style. You know, Night of the Living Dead has all of this expressionism and like extreme angles and lighting and, you know, really dynamic staging and all of that. Um, but if you think about something like, you know, the first couple Evil Dead movies or I, I don't know, I'm, of course I'm standing in front of everybody and all other examples are completely gone from my head. But it's a genre that's really, it really encourages creativity in visual style and audio style. Um, and so it's like, a, it's always been a really good showcase for young emerging filmmakers, I think. Um, yeah, is that, is that what you meant or am I, am I understanding? Yes. Yeah, Marty. The Living Dead weekend is June 7th through the 9th <laughs> at the Monroeville Mall if you want to come this year. Um, and uh, there's also a screening in April of Dawn of the Dead at the mall movie theaters. Oh, really? There's going to be some of us doing, uh, doing a Q&A there. So that, that might be kind of fun if you're a fan. So. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. The, if you don't know, Dawn of the Dead hasn't been in theaters or like available legally um, for, for a really long time. And so it's coming back like for one weekend simultaneously around the country. So yeah, it'll be playing here at the Harris and down at the gun. I'm supposed to introduce the one at the Harris, but going to see it at the mall sounds really fun too. <laughs> Laura, how many times do you want to see Dawn of the Dead next weekend? <laughs> okay, thank you. Not a question, but let people know you have the book here available okay. for sale. Yeah, if anybody wants a copy of the book, I've, I've got the book, yeah. Um, I think do we, we should clear out. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Susie and Harrison and Bill and Mika. And thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. This was a blast. <laughs>